Amen. My name is Jeffrey. I serve as the lead pastor here. That was my dad. So, Pastor Rob, you can... I, I, he's like, oh, I'm sorry it took too long. I, don't, I can't tell you how many sermons of his I interrupted or robbed time of. So, it's payback. So, <laughs> but it's, it's a good word. And so, I, you don't want to quench the spirit when things are happening um, in a direction that you approve of and the Lord approves of. This is my wife, Amanda. And we have four wonderful kids, Noah, Heidi, Franklin, and Theodore. And uh, yesterday, uh, Heidi decided she was going to sell croissants at the Children's Business Fair, which is November 30th. And uh, so Amanda and, and her did a test run, and she will not be selling croissants <laughs> at, at the Children's Business Fair. It was an all-day thing. I think we wrapped up like at 1130 or they wrapped up. It was a 12 hour process. And um, it was a moment where Amanda's like, Heidi's asleep. The dough could not rise and we could just go to bed. But we it was just like we have to a lot. We have to teach our kids that our yeses are yes or no is our no. And if we set out to do something as silly as making croissants that only our family is going to eat. The only reason why you know this story is because I'm telling you this story. So it was super important for us that we just had our yes be our yes, our no be our no. And then we had an opportunity where Heidi said she was going to do something and she's going to back out of that thing. And now she's saying, I'm not going to do it. And we had to say, hey, the croissants are really hard to make. And we wanted to, mom wanted to quit, but she didn't. Her yes was her yes, her no was her no. And Heidi just looks at me and goes, well, croissants are different. I was like, no, you said you're going to do this thing. So you need to stay faithful in doing this thing. When we're raising kids, there's always this struggle that who we are is still in the process of sanctification and it can be messy, but we, we have to understand that our kids are watching us. Not only are our kids watching us, our community is watching us. And so we have to be faithful to handle the things in scripture, our character, our integrity, our principles with so much ease on simple things like baking the croissants that you said you were going to bake. Your yes being your yes and your no being your no. As we're focused in on the last part of this year with walking out in holiness, let me just like give a little break here, okay? You cannot walk in holiness without Jesus. It is impossible to walk in holiness without Jesus or without the Holy Spirit. And so this is not, these aren't messages so you can try better or be stronger or here's 10 points of how you can live out a Christian life and you can become more holy. This is about us being submitted. And I just wanted to tell you that one story about how um, your yes has to be your yes, your no has to be your no. And this ties into holiness Today, we're really focusing on um, how, uh, was how to clean sin. How many of you know what sin is? You can raise your hand. Okay, some of you didn't raise your hand. You're, you're all very familiar with sin. You've all done it. I've done it. And we're going to walk through sin. Obviously, we're going to talk about the cross. And I think there's some pretty practical but amazing things that the Lord's revealed uh, through this. I want to start first by reading Romans 3.23 um, out loud. So if you could flip there to Romans uh, 3.23. And a lot of you are familiar with this, but I just want to say it out loud. If you could stand with me as we read God's word uh, together and then we'll pray. Romans 3, 23 through 26 says this, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a portion of by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. Verse 26 it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier for the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you gave Jesus. Thank you that Jesus submitted his will as a man 
in the garden to take on the cross. Thank you that Jesus, thank you that you, like you told Pontius Pilate that no man takes my life, but I give it freely. Thank you, Jesus, that you gave your life freely for us because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of your glory. And we receive this gift called salvation through your death, burial, and resurrection. It's only through you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As we talk about sin, I just, we, the church has gone through these histories where it seemed like sin was the only thing we talked about. Hell, fire, and brimstone. You're all sinners in the hands of an angry God, and you're all going to hell. Like, you've, you've heard those fiery sermons. I got saved under kind of that paradigm. Like, I got saved at five and baptized, baptized in water at five. And then I really rededicated the Lord when I was eight, and I watched the play Hell's, uh, Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames, where, like, people die, and then they go to heaven, and then the angel reads their life and their judgment. And if they accepted Jesus, the heavens open up and the choir loft sang and it was beautiful. And then if they didn't, the stage would open up and demons would come out and drag people to hell. And it was very scary. And I was like, that's it. I'm Jesus is all that I want. <laughs> Cause as an eight year old, I was convinced there's wolves that lived under the stage. I don't know why I just was. And I was like, I know that that's a bad place and I never want to go under there ever. So I'm going to go up to the baptistry where heaven is. I mean, I was eight. So we've all, a lot of us have salvation stories where the preacher came out really heavy about you are a sinner in need of a savior. And how you, how many of you know that that's very true? That's good. And then we kind of swung into people call it like hyper grace or cheap grace. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes about cheap grace that people just want Jesus as their savior, but they don't want him as Lord. They don't really want to be a disciple. They just want to get out of hell. And we, we kind of, you know, God is always in a good mood, which is a terrible theology. God is in a mood. He is love. Whatever he does is just. He's Anyway, we can talk through that at Bible study. There's a good place to wrestle through these types of things. And we, we didn't want to talk about sin because if we talked about sin, then people might feel shame or they might feel sorrow or they might feel uh, condemned. And we kind of use Romans 8 as there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can't take the first part of that verse and say that there's no condemnation because there should be conviction of the Holy Spirit on people because we are serving a holy God. And if we bring things in that are in us um, into his presence that is holy, we're going to get uncomfortable a little bit. I mean, I, I know that when I did something I shouldn't do or that my parents would disapprove of, and then I was in their presence, I became really aware of the sin that I just committed because I was in front of people who would call me out on that. I mean, we grew up in a family that had family meetings. You know what a family meeting is? You all get together and discuss the sin in your life or that you're moving or someone's pregnant. Like I went there automatically. There's a family meeting. Who's pregnant? You're getting a divorce or we're moving. And like I try to get the top three covered. And then it was like, no, it's about this or it's about this or it's about Robbie. <laughs> you can talk to him about it <laughs> later. Oh, man. I want to tell a story, but I'm not going to right now. No, no, it's. It wouldn't do anything for this group, but make us all laugh. Um, but you have this thing in our life where our flesh, how we want to sin, our selfishness is at battle with the spirit man in us. We're, we're, it's a wrestling match, right? Because we, yes, we have the Holy Spirit. Yes, we've been redeemed. Yes, the blood of the lamb. Yes, all these things. But it's a not yet. It's not a full we're not fully there yet. We're still baking. 
How many, you've had really good moments with the Lord and you feel really great, maybe a great prayer service or a great worship service and a great sermon. And you're like, my life is going to change. I'm going to love my wife and my kids are amazing. And then someone cuts you off. And then all the vows you made at the altar are gone or you're hungry or you get cut in line or you get served the wrong food. And all of a sudden you take out all the unrighteousness of your life on your server who's just trying to earn tips. That's it. Like trying to do their best. So we all have this thing called sin in our life. And what is sin? That's really good. And everyone, you've heard this like sin in the Hebrew is to miss the mark. Like if there were a target and you were aiming at something, you would miss the target. We watched Robin Hood, the cartoon version of Robin Hood yesterday. And Robin Hood was really good at hitting the mark, wasn't he? And so you kind of have this idea that sin is, is like, oh, he just missed the target. And it's this really passive, forgiving, kind of an easy thing that we kind of throw out there. But let, I, want to, I want to reference Genesis 3, where the fall of man happens. God made paradise. He created all the earth in, seven, uh, in six days and then rested on the seventh. And he made Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden. And he put them in paradise where there was no sin. And he had two trees in the middle. He had the tree of life, which they were allowed to eat from. And he had the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which they weren't allowed to eat from. That was the only thing that God told them not to do. He's like, you can have everything. You have dominion. The animals are yours. You've named them all. You have each other. Yes, enjoy it. Enjoy. And then God would meet Adam and walk with him in the cool of the day. This is awesome. He's, this is what the mark is. If sin is missing the mark, the mark is being in his presence in the cool of the day where you're fully exposed. Like there's nothing that is, you're hiding behind. There's nothing you're hiding from. There's nothing you're trying to conceal. You have access to everything that he's created. You have access to all of his goodness and the tree of life and the Holy Spirit. And there's things growing and there's work, but it's not hard work. It's not by the sweat of your brow. There's labor, there's things being birthed, but it's not in the pains and the groans. It's not this, this is what the mark is. The mark is paradise. The mark is being in his presence. So when we say, oh, brother, you just missed the mark. What you're saying is you've missed his presence. You've missed his kingdom. The mark is his kingdom. So we, like the seriousness of sin has to weigh on us differently than what it's been as the church language has become this kind of this soft language. Oh, he just missed it. Come back in. That's there. But what does it mean to miss the mark? You missed, you missed his kingdom. Not only did we miss his kingdom when we sin, but we partner with our flesh in the kingdom of darkness. It's not, it's not just a simple, oh, you missed the target, get the arrow and try again. There is that. But the weight of sin is so much heavier than, oh, you just missed it. Try again. Let's sweep her under the rug. Give her a little sweeperoo. You'll feel better. If you just play that one worship song and you cry a little bit and journal, everything will go away. But this fall of man means that they miss the mark. And because they miss the mark, what does God say? God says that through the seed of Adam, sin will be transferred. This is something that we're born into. We're born with the nature that misses the mark. We're born with a, a selfishness and a flesh that prefers the kingdom of darkness over the kingdom of light. We like ourselves. This is selfish. Like what we talked about uh, last week, the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like that, to love your neighbor as yourself. The most loving thing that you can do for your neighbor is to die. To die to yourself and become more like Christ. That's the invitation because our sinful nature wants to be selfish. We want to work on self-preservation. We want to be seen. We want to be celebrated. We want to be prideful. We want to have ego. You're like, well, no, I don't. Well, then, okay, then stop sinning. I, I, I definitely do. Like, this is, this is what the struggle is with. And it's not so cavalier to say, oh, you just missed the mark. It's, you missed the mark, you missed 
paradise. You missed his kingdom. And there should be a breaking because every time you miss the kingdom, that's what Jesus died for. The price of missing the kingdom is death. Whoa. There should be a weight on what you're hearing right now. Genesis 3, so the fall, or the Adam and Eve, God puts them in the middle of the garden and there's two trees and he says, don't eat of this one. And then the serpent comes, who's more cunning than all the rest and tempts Eve and then Eve eats the fruit and gives it to Adam, which implies that Adam was there the whole time and he wasn't leading his family. Why did he fall away so hard? I don't know. They're both to blame. Everyone's like, oh, it's Eve's fault. It's Adam's fault. They both got a curse for all of mankind. I think they're both equally sharing the burden, right? They both sinned, and which introduces sin nature. So the first principle in sin that we have to understand is they defy or they disobeyed what God was asking them to do. They disobeyed one of God's principles, one of his commands, however you want to say it. They missed the mark because they violated what God had said. They, which means they violated the principles of God's relationship. That means they violated the kingdom of God. They violated sowing and reaping. They violated everything. When they did that one sin, they violated all sin. And that's really important for us to understand because when we think of sin, what I'm about to show you is that there's two categories in which sin can fall into. And then then there's other subcategories like the sins that you don't know you're committing, then the sins that you do commit, there's sins of omission, there's sins of commission. There's, it kind of breaks into these, but these are really the two principles that I want to show you throughout scripture. So the first through the fall, we understand that they broke God's commandments. They broke what God had said. And that was, I don't know, not good. But here's the promise. This is the first time in Genesis 3.15 that we're promised a savior. This is, this is the, so cool uh, where God is saying, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall, uh, and you shall bruise his heel. So this is God talking to the servant and he's promising that the offspring of the woman, not man. That's why Jesus was born of a virgin. Because the this, this nature of sin is passed on through the seed of man. So Jesus had to come through a virgin birth. And that's what we read in Luke and Matthew and Mark, that Jesus came through a virgin birth. This is God fulfilling Genesis 3.15 through the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary and her conceiving of Jesus and then being born and living a sinless life. All the way there. Jesus is promised all the way in Genesis 315. So if it was just about Jesus, Dallas Willard talks about if our sanctification, our relationship with Jesus was just about Jesus dying, why wouldn't Jesus die right here in the garden? Why did it take so long? Because heaven is concerned with the appointed time in which the word is fulfilled. It's not just, let me, I want to say this. I'm not being heretical. It's salvation is extremely important. But if it were just about salvation, then Jesus would have died right here. But what did the whole Old Testament, the whole New Testament, my dad brought up Malachi 3, and I can hear it in the room and on the chats, all the angry people who hate giving and their arms are crossed. And well, Malachi 3 is for the priest and we're not priests. Our, the first fruits are about fruit. And I don't have orchards, so I can't bring fruits. That's silly, but I've heard it. Yes, Malachi 3 is about the priest, but First Peter says that we are priests. You can't, you can't escape this stuff. So he, what, what's the point that I'm trying to make? If it's not just about salvation, but it's just about sanctification. It's about our holiness, that we're pursuing who God is. That we're dying to our flesh every day and becoming more like Christ. And yes, we trust God's timing that Jesus was sent at the right time and that you were born at the right time. 
and I know, I know, like there's a lot going on in society and there's a lot with politics and there's a lot with entertainment and who's getting arrested for what and who's singing what and what was said on the debate and what was said on, there's so much going on and we should be concerned, we should be involved, right? In fact, like next week, we're gonna have, you can, you'll be able to, we'll have papers that you can register to vote here next week because you should be involved. We as Christians, like, what does our constitution say? We, the people, you should be involved. I'm not telling you to vote for, I'm not trying to, I'm not endorsing anyone. I'm not praying about anything in particular. I'm saying that you should be involved. We all should be involved. And even if you don't want to vote, even if you have something against that, would you go like go to one thing, go to one board meeting, go to one school board meeting, go to one NIC board meeting, go to one town hall and just show up and pray. Please just show up and pray. Don't put your head in the sand. Don't partner with the political spirit and get all bent out of shape because he said, she said, and you start wrestling against flesh and blood, which we're told not to do in Ephesians 6. Just pray, just show up and pray. I remember I showed up to an NIC board meeting and I, it was like really controversial. I don't know if you've seen the news, but for me, I like conflict. Man, I'm ready. Yes, there's a fight. And I was texting a man. I was like, if we're fighting. It's so good. <laughs> we're happening. And she goes, are you, are you partnering with peace? Or are you partnering with conflict? <laughs> like maybe I should leave. <laughs> <laughs> it's an invitation to pray. So why, why are we even talking about this? Because it's not just about our salvation, but it's our sanctification. That we're becoming more like Jesus. Let's go to Genesis 4. That's kind of bridges into what I'm talking about. Genesis 4, you have Cain and Abel, who are the, the first set of brothers. And Cain was, he had an orchard, and Abel had, he did sheep, and they were bringing an offering to the Lord. And Cain brought an offering, just kind of something over here, just kind of threw a basket together. And Abel brought his first offering, or his first fruits, or best offering, or his best offering. And God had favor on Abel. Was offering, and he looked at contempt on contempt at Cain's offering, and Cain got upset at Abel. He actually got jealous, and instead of rising up to a standard that God had for him, he thought it would be better to blow out the life of Abel, so he was the only one left. So many of us in the church, we approach relationship that way. We get jealous of other people. We want what they want. We want what they have. We want their anointing. We want whatever it is. And instead of rising up to the level that God's called us to, we try to blow out the lives of other people. So why are we talking about, we have this first sin in the fall in Genesis 3, where it caused all these curses to come and you violate what God is saying. Then you have Cain that only does, he also, he violates what God is saying by taking life, but he violates his brother. He violates the community in which he's called to live in. This is just as bad as the other one. Because if you violate what God says, you violate the community. If you violate the community, you're violating what God said. You can't get out of these, but these two examples are being used to show you that there is, you can violate what God said through Genesis 3, but you can violate the community that we're called to. And you do that by what Abel did is he violated what God said first, and then his interaction with his brother was then violated where he killed his brother. And what does Cain say? God comes to, uh, and talks to Cain and he's like, where's Abel? What, is, what does Cain say? Do you remember? Am I my brother's keeper? And you know what is so, if you go to Acts 2, let's turn there because I've got the word here so I can do this. Acts 2. Dun, dun, dun. I wasn't planning on this. Acts 2. 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs are being, uh, being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Why is Genesis 4 so important that, we're vi that Cain violated God's word by violating his brother? 
And then he asked this arrogant question, am I my brother's keeper? And then the new, the new, the new Testament of what we're called to, to fulfill the old, what is this? What is this question that we have to answer? Are you your brother's keeper? And if you read Acts, yes, you are your brother's keeper. The first quarrel that the church had is because another brother or sister were not being kept. The widows were not being taken care of. They weren't being fed. The violations that you read all throughout 1 Corinthians is because brothers weren't keeping brothers. We're to keep each other accountable. We're supposed to keep each other encouraged. We're supposed to keep each other in the word. We're supposed to keep each other. We're to be concerned about one another. Why? Because when we're not, we partner without selfishness. If we know what we're not, that's exactly what we're doing. Therefore, violating words, the, the God's law because we're violating one another. And then what does he say even further? This is God talking to Cain. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? That was Cain's issue, but it could be, why, are you, why do you have envy towards that person? Why do you have contempt? Why do you have bitterness? Why do you have unforgiveness? Insert the blank here. This is a really good question that God's asking. Why are you angry and why is your face fallen? Why are you downcast in your own sin? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And what God is saying is, I've laid out for you how to do well. I've given you my principles. You can do well. You have to choose to do well. You have to submit your free will every day to do well. And this is what, verse 7, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. The sin in our lives, when we want to miss the mark because of whatever reason, wants you to miss the mark. There's an enemy that is real that wants you to miss the mark. The enemy doesn't want you in God's presence. The enemy doesn't want you in community with one another. The enemy doesn't want you to pray. The enemy doesn't want you to do these things. And a lot of the times we can blame the devil for something that we're choosing to do. We give him a lot of credit. He's just not that smart. He's really not. I mean, Revelation says you'll look at his true form and laugh. Oh, I miss, I turned my page here. So we have these principles where God says something. You can violate God's principles to God. This is the vertical. And you can violate the principles of God to one another. So where do you find that in scripture? Well, you find it here in Genesis 3 and 4. You also find it in Exodus 21 through 17, where God lays out the Ten Commandments. The first five commandments are commandments on how to not violate your relationship with God. The last five commandments are commandments on how, you not, how do you not violate your brother. So they're equally portioned out. This is how you, how you stay true in God's commandments, and this is how you stay true with one another. And then you go even further in the New Testament, Jesus, Matthew 22 through 37 through 40, does the same thing. The first commandment is love, your Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. So we can boil it down. These principles are reflecting back in Matthew as they're looking, looking at Genesis 3 and 4. Then they go to the, the Ten Commandments, and then they, they go to the greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment, that sin causes us to violate God's principles, and it can cause us to violate one another. This is what sin does. Here's, I guess, the encouraging part. Um, Romans 6 uh, let's see, 23, for all wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm trying to get principles because I've noticed that when I preach and I give a long list, what people do is they justify the list. Well, I'm not, I didn't murder. I'm not like Cain, exactly. Well, I didn't have, I didn't commit adultery. Well, I didn't do this. Well, I didn't steal. Well, I didn't. If you give out the list of sins, people try to use that as check marks of, oh, I'm good. The pastor didn't say this one particular sin that's very specific 
but then it violates a principle. That's why I'm trying to speak on principles that we can understand. Did I violate God's rules and God's commandments and God's kingdom? Have I violated a brother? This is what Paul is trying to say all in 1 Corinthians. Hey, it's okay to eat meat, but if your, other, if your brother calls it a sin, don't eat meat in front of him. Hey, it's okay to wear a mask, not a sin. But if wearing a mask offends you, make sure to not violate your brother if he's wearing a mask. But that's kind of recent with 2020. I know I'm like, I'm hitting on things. Well, what about fear? What about this? And what about that? Doesn't matter. Have you met that brother where he's at or the sister where she's at? Have you had coffee with them? Have you connected with them? Do you know their heart? Are you just assuming they're living in fear? Maybe they have a legitimately uh, defective immune system and they actually have to do it. We're, we make mountains out of molehills on these things and we violate God's principles all the way while we're doing it. It's this terrible spiritual pride of self-justification. It's awful. And what we have to understand is this truth in Romans 6, 23, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And those wages, what it costs to pay for those sins is death. And Jesus was that death. He became sin so we would know no sin. It's only through him. It's only through his cross, the, the cross that he took, that he died, that he conquered sin, death, and shame in the grave, and that we have life and life abundantly. The wages of sin is death. It was a debt that he paid. Now, people say, why would a good God send people to hell? And God's not sending people to hell. People are choosing to pay for the sin for the rest of all of eternity. So you, the invitation is, I can put my life at the feet of Jesus and take this free gift of salvation and he can pay for my sin or I can live for myself and I can pay for my sin of all eternity, which means I'm separated from God because if you die paying for your own sin, that means you've missed the mark. You've missed eternity. You've missed his presence. You've missed his goodness. You've missed all that he had for you, not just for this life, but the life forever and ever, and ever, and ever. What's the fruit of sin? The fruit of sin, or the idea that the enemy has, is to still kill and destroy. So we can look at, the, our, ask ourselves these questions. What in my life is being stolen? Well, first, to really understand what in your life is being stolen, you have to understand what promises that God has for you. And they're not 100% guaranteed, nor is his timing guaranteed. So you have to be careful with this one of like, oh, this prosperity or this promise, that's been stolen from me because I haven't yet seen it. So that could be the enemy. It could be sin or it could just be God's timing. So be careful when you're wrestling through these, that when we say things are stolen, that they're authentically, like truly stolen. Like the enemy's hand is on stealing, killing, death, it is appointed that all men die, so not all death is the enemy, but there can be a lot of death in relationship, death in finances, death in your body, death in your emotions. Those are all ways that the enemy could work. And remember, he's not very smart, but he is subtle. It's just a little compromise, little compromise, little compromise when all of a sudden you are drifting away from him. The third thing the enemy tries to do or the fruit of sin can do is destroy it destroys relationship, destroys finances, destroys your emotions, destroys your marriage. This is what we could point to that is sin. Sometimes because we live in a sinful fallen state, things get destroyed. Because we live in a sinful fallen state, things die. Because we live in a sinful fallen state, things get stolen. Time gets stolen. Now, the idea is not to partner with those things because that's what the enemy wants to do. But you're not, you're not partnering with those things. You want to partner with the things of, of the Father, the fruit of the Father, which is through the Holy Spirit. But it's really, this is coming from John 10.10. 10. What's the fruit of holiness? The fruit of holiness is life. And then the second fruit of holiness is abundant life. 
This is what it truly means. Jesus is saying in that, I'm the shepherd, I'm the gate. You have to come through me. There's no other side door. You can't say, you can't say sin isn't sin anymore. <laughs> you can't change the requirements to walk through the door. That's what we're doing in the church these days, aren't we? I'm a narrow, oof. When, when we downgrade things that the Bible calls sin to not sin, we, comprom we say that we're putting ourselves in the place of Christ and saying that I can make a new door. That I can build this way into heaven. What did the Pope say this week? All ways lead to heaven. There's only one way that leads to heaven, and that's through Jesus. So this, yeah, we can clap for that. That's amazing. The seriousness of what we're talking about isn't meant to be a heavy weight that you can't bear. It's supposed to be a reminder of why we even take communion, to remember the heaviness of the cross, of his blood, of his sacrifice, is because we send. Are you gonna are you gonna send in an hour? I don't I don't know. Maybe you have all the framework to do it. So do I. We have to work out our faith and fear and trembling every day. Do we really think that thinking of the cross and the blood? And his body once a month is really going to call us back to repentance. This is a daily thing. This is an eternal thing. Like daily, when, when we talk about the greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, it's a reference to Deuteronomy 6 with the Shema. And he says, what it really says is, hear, O Israel, pay attention. It's the same thing that Jesus says in Matthew 13 when he's talking about the parable of the talents. Hear, let those who have ears, let them hear, let them understand. Let them actually hear the word and do it. Don't be just lit, hearers of the word and so deceive yourself, but do what it says. So the Shema says, whenever you wake up, whenever you lay down, whenever you're on your way, whenever you're eating, think upon these things. This is how quickly we forget the cross. This is how quickly we forget that we're in it for one another. This is how quickly forget we forget God's presence and God's goodness. We can be encountering him right here and then 30 minutes walk away and forget everything. We're to have daily constant reminders when you wake up, when you lay down, when you're on your way. This isn't for kids. This is for all of us. We so easily forget his goodness. We so easily forget his presence. So life and life abundantly is to not just walk through the door of salvation, but to stay in the field and submit yourself to sanctification. This is the invitation. First John 1, 7 says this, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son cleanses us from all sin. Hear what that is saying. If we walk in light as he is in the light, what two things do we receive? We receive forgiveness of sin by the blood of Jesus. That means we're right with God. And then what? And fellowship with one another. Don't, don't miss the importance of that. Now, in Jewish writing, the most important thing is actually said last. So the fact that John says that you'll have fellowship with one another and then the forgiveness of sins. He's trying to put importance to the last thing. But the second thing that he's saying is right up top that you will have fellowship with one another. It's so important. We cannot forget that. That's why when we talk about sin, we have to talk about violating God and violating one another. That's why it's so important for us to have community with one another and communion with one another and relationship with one another and bear each other's burdens and don't neglect the gathering of the saints and pray for one another and support one another and raise money for one another when there's hard times that fall. I 
Okay, so what do you do? You have sin. We all have sin. How do you really clean it? So we talked about principles of violating God, violating one another. We talked about practices, the Ten Commandments, and the greatest commandments in Matthew 23. We know that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. It's sin wants to kill, steal, and destroy in our life. But when we walk in holiness, are away from sin, when we hit the mark, we have life and life abundantly. So what do you do? What do you do when there is sin? What do you do when you've missed the mark? What do you do when you're out of God's presence? What do you do when you don't feel God anymore? Let me just put a caveat right there for a second. Not feeling God is not necessarily mean that you're walking in a massive sin. It could just be a time where God is walking you through a dark night of your soul where he's encouraging you to hunger after him. So you can have this practice, what David says, uh, search me and know me. If there's any evil or wicked way in me, expose it. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't keep showing you and showing you, he's trying to turn up the dial of your hunger. So you go after him, you pursue him in all things. There's a great book. I'd encourage you all to read it. It's called Practicing His Presence by Brother Lawrence, written in the 1600s. And he was a monk in France. And he said, I hate the organized prayers and the organized church services. I don't feel God in them at all. But where I do feel God is when I'm sweeping the floor. Because I've just decided to do all things unto him. He's like, I don't feel God when I'm reading something with other monks. I feel God when I'm washing the dishes because I'm doing it unto my brothers. I'm doing it with him. And in his journals, Brother Lawrence says, this took me 10 years to get to this point. And I know in the world of Easy Mac, where you can have a meal in 30 seconds or less and fast food, it's hard for us to say, hey, in 10 years, you'll, you can, if you practice God's presence in all things, you'll feel God when you're doing the dishes. No one's like, ah, uh, I don't think so. I think I'll have someone else do the dishes. But you can. This is, this, we're playing the long game in practicing his presence. So what do you do when you have sin? That's a really good question. One, we have to know that Jesus did it all. There's nothing we can actually do but submit. Jesus died on the, he lived a sinless life. He was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. He died on the cross for me and for you. And it's through that his death, burial and resurrection that we can walk in righteousness. Romans says it's his righteousness on our account, not even ours. So what do you do when you have sin? When you've done something that violates God or violates another brother, one, you confess. What does it mean to confess? It means that you tell God and you tell someone that you trust. That's a really important thing. What holds people back from confession sometimes to one another is that will they be able to trust the person that they're confessing with? Because what you don't want to do is confess a sin and then it becomes the gossip of the, of the community. Therefore, violating the community. Therefore, it begets more sin. So I guess even a better question, be someone who someone can confess to. Let it be your spouse. It doesn't have to be a whole group of people. At least one person knows and can hold you accountable and say, hey, I know you struggle with this. I know this is something you've confessed. What are you doing in your life to eliminate that pattern in your life? Something as practical is that because what's kept in the dark grows. What's exposed to the light dies. Amen. So confess, we have to confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive those Two, We have to repent, meaning we have to change our mind. Okay, Lord, I know I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I repent. No, it means I have to change my mind. If I'm living in such a way that is producing sinful behavior. I have to change my body. I have to change my mind. I have to change my thoughts. I have to change my habits. I have to change my patterns. I have to change my mind. And that is an active hand-on-hand -hand combat that could take years. I know I've heard of people who've went right when they accept Jesus, 
it's like they don't want to drink anymore. They stop cussing. They stop smoking. And it's like this, all of a sudden, this, pi- this gift of piety that's been given to them. Some of us, that's not the case. Some of us, it's the, the struggles that we wrestle with. And that's where confession is really important. If I can go to Robbie and say, man, I'm really dealing with pride. And we're in a meeting and I have a prideful moment or a prideful thought. And he picks up on that. He can come to me and correct me on that. Now, I, to, to really repent means I have to change my ways. I have to ask myself, why do I feel this pride? Why did I say this? What, there's something broken in me. What, what have I done in the last, I don't know, 7 to 12 to 21 days that led me to feel I was entitled to this thing or wanted to be celebrated? What do I, what, how am I, how am I really seeing how God sees me that I feel like I need to be validated by men and not by him? So you start to ask yourself these questions. And this is, this is the, not the game, but this is the invitation of repentance that you begin to make a list of all these things of, okay, I have this issue with food. And if I look at my patterns, I go to McDonald's and get a sausage egg and cheese McGriddle and a large orange juice every day because it's the same way that I go to work. That is the most blessed breakfast meal in the world that is so good and I go there every day it's just in my pat I don't even it's like I get the bag and it's like I come to it's like where did this come from I guess it's the ram in the thicket I'll just eat it and then I eat it and then I do the same pattern time and time and time again. To repent means to change my mind. I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to drive a different direction. Just, are you following? Like, this is the practical things about repentance that we don't talk about. It's just, oh, come up here and repent. No, change the way you go to work if on the way is causing you problems, is causing you to sin. Change where you sit in church. If it's causing you to sin, if it's causing you to judge someone you shouldn't judge. Are you, are you following? So repentance means to change my mind. Three, what I do is I ask for forgiveness. I literally have to ask, Lord, forgive me. I've confessed these sins. I've changed my mind. Lord, forgive me that I violated your ways and forgive me that I violated someone else. And if you do violate someone else, you have to ask for forgiveness for that person, from that person. Hey, staff, I was prideful and my whole ego was on this thing. Will you forgive me? I can't tell you how many times I've done that and will do that. Probably this week, I'll do that again. Right? So you, to ask for forgiveness means you're asking for forgiveness from the father and you're asking for forgiveness from your brother or your sister. Number four, you ask for the Holy Spirit. You ask if this is your first time that you're being saved, You ask for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Actually, you want to be baptized. That'd be your next step, right? You'd be baptized in water and baptized in fire. It doesn't matter which one comes first. There's been times where people go under in water baptism and they come out speaking in tongues. There's sometimes people get filled with the Holy Spirit and then we put them in water. It doesn't, the order of those things don't happen, but there's an infilling and there's a going public that now your life is surrendered to Jesus. October 20th, that Sunday is when we'll have water baptism. So if you need to get baptized in water, then you need to, we'll invite you to do that. That'd be hard to do today, but you can, uh, when you're walking through this process, ask for the Holy Spirit. Because if you've missed the mark, you could, you've grieved the Holy Spirit, you may have driven him away. He might be hanging out close to you because he never leaves you nor forsakes you, but yet he's not in you, he's not driving. Does that make sense? So you ask for an infilling. We see this model all throughout the book of Acts. Lord, Acts 4, what do they ask for? They ask for an infilling of the Holy Spirit for boldness to do what God's called them to do. So you ask for a filling of the Holy Spirit if you never received a baptism of the Holy Spirit, or you ask for a refilling. This is something we should do every day. Confess, repent, ask for forgiveness, ask for a refilling of the Holy Spirit, and then... um, Number five, repent or wash, recycle, clean, reuse, reduce, whatever. Keep, these just keep going. 
all, all over again. Repeat as often as you sin. Confess, repent, ask for forgiveness, ask for the Holy Spirit as often as you sin. As often as you're made known of sin in your life. Remember the cross and then rejoice in the resurrection. Day, this is a daily thing. So how do you clean sin? Right here. Yes, it's only done by the cross, but this is how you submit your will to it. Confess, repent, ask for forgiveness, and ask for the Holy Spirit. So as we close today, I have to give an invitation. I feel led to do this. If you've never, if you, have, if, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, and you're, you're living in sin, and whatever that sin is, and whatever the fruit of that is, it could be that you feel completely lost. It could be that you, all you see is darkness when you think of eternity. It could be that you have no joy in your life. The things that did bring you happiness no longer bring you happiness. That you're shot through with anxiety and depression. You feel completely hopeless. These are all, these could be signs that you're not yet in a full relationship with Jesus. Now, believers have anxiety, believers have depression, but I'm talking about the sheer hopelessness where every, when you think of eternity and the end of your life, all you see is darkness. That is not from the Lord. That's not what the Lord has for you. And so if that's you, the Bible says that when we start a relationship with Jesus, it's weird that we're called to count the cost. This is an expensive thing for us to do, but it's the best thing that you can do. Yes, it's a free gift, but it costs you everything. It's a full surrender of your life. So if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and you aren't on a path of sanctification to become more like him, I'm going to invite you to do that today. I'm going to invite you. I'm going to give you the invitation this is not just a prayer. This just starts it, but we have to take our next step to walk these things out so we can become more like Jesus. That's the invitation. It's not just, it's not filling out a card. It's not raising up your hand. This is an invitation to say yes to Jesus and start a relationship with him. And here's, here's the promise that hopelessness will go away. You'll begin to see light. You'll begin to see hope. The sin that you feel or the darkness you feel, the hole that you feel will start to be filled. Will it be instant? For some, yes. But the promise is that if you, as you pursue him, he pursues you. And in fact, God's been pursuing you your whole life. We can't look at the cross and not know that. Jesus has been pursuing you his whole life. So if you're sitting here today and you have not started a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you've gone so far away from him that you don't even feel him anymore and you want to rededicate, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do exactly what we said, how to clean sin. We're going to confess. You have to tell God. You can bow your heads, close your eyes. If you're doing this for the first time or rededicating, um, man, I don't know what to do here. It's important, like this isn't, so we can count your hands and then post on social media about how awesome this service was. This is, this is about saying, I'm going all in for Jesus right now and I want someone to know it, okay? This is why we have people slip up their hand or let us know because there could be so many things of why people would hold that back. But we're going to walk through this prayer. If you're saying yes to Jesus for the first time, I would like you to slip up your hand so we can see. If you're coming back to Jesus, you slip up your hand so we can see. So we can pray with you and for you.
to where you're at. Wherever you're at with the Lord. We're going to take a few seconds to walk through this. I want you to take 30 seconds and confess. Confess your sins to the Lord. Maybe not tell someone right now. That'd be yell across the room, maybe. This confession can be as simple as, Lord, I am a sinner. Lord, I have sinned. Then number two is you repent. Lord, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And I repent. I I decide right now and change my mind to follow your ways and not mine. Then you ask for forgiveness. Lord, please forgive me of my sins. Your blood forgives all my sins. It washes me white as snow. Then four. Lord, that I'm clean by your blood. I ask for an infilling of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God would come on me and come in me like never before would fill me up that I would feel the fire of heaven no one raised their hand and that's fine because there's believers in here who need to walk through this just as much as anyone else so father I thank you so much for who you are I thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit I thank you that through the cross, we can be clean, that we don't have to live in sin, that it's your righteousness and our account, that you loved us so much that you sent your one and only son to die for us. But he didn't stay that way, he rose. And in his resurrection, we have eternal life. And he sent us the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for that there was a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit today. I pray, Lord, that the voice of conviction that is the Holy Spirit would not be silenced anymore. That you would break off the shackles and the scales of comfort and bad theology. And that the voice of conviction of the Holy Spirit would ring true and loud in every believer's life. Father, thank you that we're invited to walk and serve with a holy God. That we can follow you in all your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well.